after that you have a demonstration on how to apply, how we are applying molasses to a silage. That we do here, the wrapping, the haylage. So we can have questions about the haylage over there. And here I'll talk to you briefly about the limpo grass and the jigs. Uh, my name is Joe Vendramini and I'm the forage specialist here at the research center. And the next stop that you're gonna have on, on the other side will be Maria Silveira and she's my wife. So because I'll have you first, I'll tell the joke here first. So when you go on the other side, you know, you tell her what you heard. <laughs> so, and Mr. Kerry Light is here today and we were having a conversation in the break room one day, Mr. Kerry Light and my wife and I, and we have twin daughters. So we have twin daughters and Mr. Light also has some twins in his family. So we were talking about it and he asked me if they were alike. I said, no, no, they are completely different. And he asked me, oh, how different? I said, one is really nice and kind. And he asked me, how about the other one? I said, well, the other is like the mother. <laughs> so anyway, by the time that you go on the other side, you'll have a chance to tell her that. <laughs> and you get a head start out, right? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we, we have been doing work in, work with Jigs, Bermuda grass. Jigs was released in Texas some, some time ago, but never really took off because it was a private release. So it was not released by university or USDA. It was a private company and they dropped it because they couldn't make any money. Um, and that was Southeast Texas. For many years, people didn't try or, or was not interested in Jigs until uh, they brought jigs to Florida and a lot of people here in South Florida, like Mr. Lightsey, he found out that jigs do really well for us here in South Florida because it's a Bermuda grass that do well and in poorly drained soils. So even when you have places that you have little water standing for a while, jigs can do well in those conditions. If you think about the past, we have coastal, we have Tifton 44, or TIF-85, and those didn't do well in wet places at all. So most of our TIF-85 here at the center is gone because here, as you can see around, it's pretty flat and you have water standing everywhere. So the TIF-85 didn't do well, just went away. So when the jigs is still here and doing very good. So we, we did some work on silage and plots and compare with other Bermuda grass. And as I said, it do as well as any other grass that we have around here. The nutritive value is good, very good, comparable to, to any other Bermuda grass. And the, also the growth, it's comparable to Star and Bermuda. The difference of jigs is the growth is more spread around the, the year. So that means the Star grass grows really hard in the summer and make that huge growth in one time of the year. When this one grows well in the spring, summer, and actually uh, early in the fall. So, and here for us in Florida, it's very good to have growth in the spring and fall because it's when we're supposed to have dry weather and try to make some hay. So that's why it becomes really valuable because by the time that we don't have a star or even bahia grass, many times we have jigs. And that comes a little earlier for us. Has really thin stems. Also, they help us to dry faster. The hay dry faster than, for instance, it started that has a little thicker stems or TIF-85. Some people that work with small square bales for horses, they say that a jigs is greener than the other grasses. If you look at here, you will not see the green is the same. What happened is because dry faster, it keeps the color. By the time that you bale, because you bale a little faster, it doesn't stay too long on the field, and the hay looks better. Does that mean that it is better? No, that doesn't mean that it is better, but it looks good. So mainly if you are in the business of square bales for horses, that is very attractive. And we still have questions about grazing jigs, and we did here for two years, in these pastures that you are seeing here, when you have different stocking rates, when we graze the jigs down to the ground, or we left the jigs very high. So we have three stocking rates, what would be too much grazing, ideal 
and not enough grazing. And both extremes were not good. When you overgraze it, because it's a Bermuda grass, we know that it doesn't persist. Or what happens is you overgraze it down to the ground, common Bermuda becomes more competitive. So we start seeing some encroachment of weeds and common Bermuda. So this grass is not for extensive systems that you don't manage, don't fertilize it and graze as much as you want, like you do with Bahia grass. That's not the one for that. So you need to keep a stubble height. How much? At least seven, eight inches, at least. Okay, and on the other end, what? Yes. You said seven to eight inches? Seven to eight inches, it's oh, double height. Doing good at four to six. <laughs> That's a lot of stuff. And if you harvest for hay or silage, that's good because you let the plant to regrow. But if you are grazing, if you start grazing shorter than seven, what happens? The animals come back and start hammering the same spot. That's why it's very conservative. It's good that you let that to be seven, eight inches high. Um, just an example here where you graze it short. Back, back, back. Uh-huh. You know, Joe, you've always had an accent, uh -huh. but I've gotten harder in here. Uh -huh. Now, if I'm making hay, uh -huh. you're still talking seven. No, eight. no, no, no. Okay. No. You so can't. I'm you... at four, four, four five three. inches on hay, and I'm okay. You are fine. It's only not the ground. Right. And I'll the stubble height that I'm talking about is on grazing. When you have animals on top, if you have machines harvesting, you control the time that you come back, right? So you don't need to be concerned well, the about weather, mother nature, really. <laughs> yeah. So for grazing, that's what we saw. Just an example here, where we graze it short to four inches, it was, we have about 40% uh, lost in stem after two years of hammering every day during the growing season. So, and that's not that all the plants die. What happened was said is common Bermuda and other weeds took over. So in the last two years, we have been spraying and fertilizing again to try to get it back where it was. But it hurts, they stand really bad. So don't overgraze jigs, don't abuse. You know, it's a good grass, but you need to manage it right. And keep your fertilization, pH, and everything. It's not a replacement for Bahia grass. It's a replacement for more productive grasses. So the other talk will be about the new limpo grass. I will tell you a little bit on the history of the new limpo grass. Um, Dr. Quisenberry did a cross between Bigalta and Floralta. Bigalta was the good nutritive value uh, limpo grass that didn't persist and die. And Floralta is the one that everybody has around, is the common uh, limpo grass. So he crossed both and tried to get something that would be as persistent with better nutritive value, better digestibility. That was the objective. So we started with 100 plants that we have here and in Gainesville. Small plots, individual plants that we grew in a plot and we harvest for two years. Out of that, we got about 15 plants that survived and did well under that cutting. And we start grazing. After that, we find, uh, we find two plants that will probably be the ones that we will release next year. So, this is one of them. This is what we call number 10, because it was number 10 in the list of the 100 hybrids that we had. One thing that really caught my attention here in Gainesville, everywhere, this number 10, we abuse it for four years now. We graze it short, we cut it short, and limpo grass is not the one that is the most persistent. Limpo grass, you know, if something bad happened, we go away. And, and this number 10 is still here. I mean, this plot here, we grazed it really short this year under all the rain we did and abuse and look at how it is. We just fertilized, took the heifers out about three weeks ago and it's back. So we really like that. And we have another one that is called 4F as Frank. And we plant back there close to those woods. And that one is show better nutritive value. That one really show a better digestibility that may, may be very good for a place where you want to harvest, like you have control of the harvest and you want a little bit more TDN on the forage. That may be the one that will produce that extra TDN. So we have these two cultivars that we are planning to release next year. So next year they will get a name 
and some producers will get the plant material and they will start multiplying and selling to other producers in different regions. So that is the plan. The Florida Cattlemen's Association was in charge of identifying producers that will multiply the material around the state. And around the state, I mean around South Florida, where limpo grass is popular. And these producers will start selling plant material to other producers in the near future, probably next year. So any questions on those? Is this it here? Go. Mr. Dave. Uh, over here where you fertilized three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and how much rain you had on that? We probably go about four inches. Do you have you any idea as to how much of that fertilizer leached out? How much that plant food? We or did don't know. The root mass take it up? Yeah. Um, by that four inches, I believe we lost a lot of that nitrogen. Or, or not a lot, but some. But I think I was lucky that the week that I fertilized was the drier week. But I, I would say that when I have a 50% recovery on nitrogen is a good outcome, right? Well, uh, some of the DNO uh, research has been that uh, fertilizing lawns, that after three or four inches, they figured the root mass took it up because the roots were so thick that they like like a sponge. Right. And, and I think we have a pretty good root mass, but it's not turf here. So um, on the recover, uh, and Maria, on the other side, we will talk more about it. On that nitrogen recover, again, if you, if you have that 50% recover from what you apply to what you can harvest as plant material above ground, that's a good, good outcome. And, uh, and I hope we will get that here, about 50%. But that, that, that doesn't mean that we didn't lose some by leaching. Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, you really the field got any more drought resistance than some of the other uh, um, Lane, I, I think I will not be able to, to tell you that. I think based on the data that we collect, we don't know. We don't know about uh, the drought resistance and we don't know about speedo bugs. I mean, we know that it's very similar to floral on that matter because they are side by side and we didn't have more damage in one than another but we don't know if there is anything specific there that will change on speedo bugs and drought okay so